morning scripture reading is in the book of Galatians, chapter 4, 1 through 11. What I am saying is that as long as an heir to underage, he is no longer different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until that time is set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the, time, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his sons into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days in months, in seasons, in years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Well, we're um, just for Christmas, we're going to do two sermons on this uh, phrase that uh, happens actually two times in the New Testament and kind of once in the Old Testament, this idea of at just the right time, uh, that God is a God that we can trust because he does things at just the right time. When we um, look at Paul's letters as compared to the Gospels, Paul really doesn't talk much about the birth of Christ, not much about the incarnation um, as far as the narrative portion. But it does speak profoundly on the meaning of Jesus coming, born in that stable. So uh, this idea of when the time had fully come, or at, at just the right time, is what I want to explore today and also on Good Friday. This idea that when Jesus came, at just the right time, it changed everything. So let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and uh, begin. Father, we are here uh, again in your presence to, to hear from you. Uh, to give uh, our lives back to you. Uh, Father, we, we confess that many times we, we drift. It's that slow drift that we take, the, the concerns of the world and the, the busyness and uh, our priorities that get discombobulated. Father, just, just throw us off course. So we're here today to, to recalibrate and to focus upon you, God, because we know that we were created primarily to worship you and give you glory. So. We want to do that again today, God. We want to be attentive to what your word says, as, as Paul uh, explains from Galatians, how you do all things well and in just the right time. And so, God, we give you the glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this passage in Galatians 4 that, uh, that Larry read uh, reflects this idea of God sending his son. Um, he is, according to Galatians, the rightful heir of all things. And, and we kind of understand that Jesus being God... We understand that he's, he owns all things. He's the heir of all things. We don't have a problem with that. Problem with that. We kind of accept that. It's a good thing, right? That God is the heir of all things. Jesus owns all things. But then in this passage, what's really exciting about it, he talks about us being heirs in the same way. And I think there's, there's this disconnect that we, we have sometimes that we don't want to accept that title because we think we're kind of making ourselves maybe kind of like God. But when the scriptures talked about these things, we need to accept them as, the, as they are. Not that we become gods, but we do become heirs of all things. And Paul explains how, is that, how does that happen? How do we become children? How do we become God's children when we were in rebellion? How do we become heirs when we owned nothing and were impoverished, but now we become heirs along with Christ? And so Paul, writing to the Gentile believers in Galatia who are uh, being tempted that they needed to adopt circumcision and go back to the Mosaic Law in order to be fully included in God's people. So they were Christians already, but what was called, we call the Judaizers, Christians who sympathized with the Old Testament. They were coming in and saying, it's great that you're following Jesus, keep doing that, but you need to observe some holidays, you need to get circumcised if you're a male, you need to follow some of the law, and that will make you fully part of God's people. And so Paul responds to that with, with forceful, a very forceful scriptural argument. And we kind of got a back from on this as we're studying Romans, right? That this idea of being attaching the law to grace is a no-no. It's new things have come, the old has gone away. So when these people are coming into Galatia and trying to do that, Paul has to kind of explain to them 
that that's not what's going on. In fact, if you fall into that, then you're actually missing this idea that, that what God has done in the coming of Christ. So the first thing he says basically to them is, is don't fall back into slavery. Slavery is really not a common uh, Christmas theme, is it? Right? We don't you know, talk about slavery much, but it's really what Christmas is about, right? It's about being free from slavery. So let me uh, kind of read that, these first three verses again in Galatians 4. Paul has to say this. What I'm saying is that, as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by the father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. So kind of for some context, in chapter 3, Paul, like he argues in Romans, has just argued that the promise to Abraham preceded the law, that when God said to Abraham that he was justified by his righteousness, by, by his, God's righteousness, by his faith in, in God, that preceded the law. So that's part, part of Paul's argument here. The law served its purpose, like we've talked about. It revealed our sinfulness, it restrained sin, yet it lacked the power to liberate us from sin. And he says the law is kind of this, this dispensation that kind of came in the middle but God has always saved people through faith, through the trust in God. So stop bringing the law into the picture of salvation when it doesn't belong there. And, and then Paul expands here that the law is like our disciplinarian. It kind of Every time we did something wrong, it said, wrong, that's bad. That's kind of the function of the law. Oh, I, you know, I, I stole, that's wrong. Oh, it's wrong, I thought it was right. And, and it kind of disciplined us to do the right thing, all along showing us that we could never do the right thing. And he says, but now in Christ, we're free from all that. We're no longer under discipline. We've now been justified. We're now children of God through faith. And this is true for Jew and Gentile, both slave and free, male and female, rich and poor. No matter what your status in the world is, you are all free in Christ because now you belong to Christ by faith. And now he says you're all not only his children, but you're also heir an heir to all of God's promises, and all of it is God's, in fact. And so Paul explained that what happened in this new age, he uses this metaphor as an heir, and what it means to be an heir. In Paul's culture, uh, heirs being still minors, if they were under the, the, the age where they recognized the Delta, and that shifted over, over time, he says they're no better than slaves. I mean, if you're six years old and your dad's uh, a, a denarier, like a billionaire, but it's denari, denarier, and he just has all the money in the world, it doesn't benefit you, right? You're, you're the kid in the house, right? You're not, you, you, you don't own it. Your, your dad and your, your mom does. And so you're going to be under their control until you're of age, where, until dad says, okay, all this stuff that's mine, now it's yours, right? There has to be this passing on of the recognition that now you're an adult and now an heir, and the father would decide when that happened. Remember the, the story of the prodigal son? Dad, I, I, I'm done, I want my inheritance now. And dad said, okay, now's the time, you can get, wrong time, but I'm gonna give it to you. The dad made the decision, right? And so, so with us, Paul continues in, in this passage, he says, while we were minors, we were under discipline. We didn't have any rights, and we were enslaved to these elemental spirits of our world. And that, that, that verse confuses a lot of people. What exactly are elemental spirits that we were enslaved to? Anybody remember being enslaved to an elemental spirit? Anybody remember that? No. You were, okay? And you may, some of us maybe still are. So the root meaning of the word translated elemental spirit, which is stokeia, is this idea of what is put into order, right? So the word is used in a lot of different ways for putting things in order, or this idea of a basic principle, right? So any, any basic principle like um, round pegs don't go in square holes. That's a basic principle, right? If you try to change that, you're, you're going to destroy the peg or the hole, right? You just destroy things when you avoid the elemental principles, these kind of these basic principles. So it's this idea of basic principles or philosophies. For example, in Colossians 2, Paul uses that same term, and he puts it a little bit differently. He says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. 
which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. So <clears throat> there he talks about these elemental spiritual forces being deceptive philosophies and human traditions that don't have any spiritual power. Uh, Colossians 2, similar thing. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all des destined to perish with use, are based on merely <coughs> excuse me, human commands and teachings. So there, elemental spiritual forces are merely human commands, human teachings, just the way the world works, right? Just the way people do things, they're in opposition to what is true and right. So Paul equates elemental spirits of the world with regulations, rules, spiritual precepts, uh, human tradition, philosophy. So the spirits here uh, are probably dem demonic be beings that maybe are behind these philosophies, but maybe they're just the doctrines themselves. So in other words, the elemental spirits of the world are worldly ideas about uh, religion or faith that are false or works-oriented are just wrong. And the Galatians are being tempted to believe these things taught by people that are trying to pass them off as truth. And so he's saying, going back to the law rather than living in grace is an elemental spirit. You're going back to, you're doing something and you're, you're focusing on that thing so much that you're missing out on the grace. The, the Judaizers are trying to add it to grace. And Paul's saying, if you add it to grace, what you get is... Not grace, right? You, you've ruined it. You've, you've tainted it. And we can't taint that which is pure and good and just. And so they were enslaved again, not being able to see the blessing of being an heir to Jesus. That's, and he came to, to set us free from those things. And so later on he asks, and we'll get to this, we'll, we'll pick this up again. So it says, now however that you've come back to know God or rather be known by him, how can you turn back? to those weak elemental spirits. What, what are you people thinking? You've been saved by grace, and now you want to do works again? You want to you check off the spiritual boxes again? You, you're making yourself a slave, and you're forgetting that now you're an heir. You're a child, and you're putting yourself under slavery again voluntarily, and that's just, frankly, silly, and actually spiritually harmful. And we're going to get back to that at, at the end here. So in other words, Paul makes this astonishing claim for the Galatians to adopt the Jewish law is the equivalent of returning to their former pagan practices. He's saying, if you go back to Judaism, it's just like going back to pagan practices again. But there's no need for that because, and this is the, the new stuff, this is the Christmas stuff, the date set by the Father, the big guy, has arrived. In the same way that the Father would decide for his son when the son would be the heir, when that would happen, God, at just the right time, has now invoked this new age where now we can become heirs. The date set by the Father has arrived. So point two, Christmas is about this new age is here. Everything has changed, and it happened at just the right time. Look at verse four. But when the set time had fully come, at just the right time, God sent his son. Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. When the fullness of time had fully come, he says, the date set by the Father so that his children can become heirs has now arrived. There is no longer time of discipline. There is no longer time of slavery. There is no longer time of, of going through life worrying about if, you, if you've made it or you haven't made it. Now, the time has fully come when you could become an heir through faith. At just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that we might, he might redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. So let me just kind of break that verse down a little bit, go phrase by phrase to kind of flush this out a little bit so we can understand what exactly happened at Christmas that I think a lot of times we, we miss because we enter Christmas, and what we do is we go back to those elemental spirits rather than that which is of Christ. The phrase, but when the fullness of time has come, is really interesting. 
That kind of thought is used throughout the scriptures. I just kind of gave a, a negative flip on it. Remember back in the Old Testament, uh, it's, uh, God is about to um, th th put this with the Israelites want to know why God aren't you punishing these people that are persecuting us. And he says, the sin of the Amorites is not complete yet, right? And that would be complete until David, right? So he's saying, the Amorites have sinned. I'm still giving them time to repent, but eventually their sin is going gonna, is gonna to fill up and I'm going to judge it, right? The time had not come yet. God always does things in perfect time. And in this verse here, in the positive light, he's saying, the time for Messiah hasn't come yet. Right? Throughout the Old Testament, we have these cries from the prophet, God, will you please come down and make it right? Please come down. And throughout the centuries, because people have been praying that God would come down and make it right. And God has been saying, I know you want it to happen now. The time's not right. The fullness of time has not come. But Messiah will come when the time is right. And so people cry out to God, and they blame God because God doesn't rescue them right away. And God's saying, you've got to understand my timing is the best. And this is what Paul is saying here, at just the right time. This phrase, the fullness of time, marks God's intrusion into time with his answer for people. God usually is outside. God very rarely breaks into our time as God and does things. When he does it, we call these things miracles, right? He does. He puts his hand into human history and he parts the Red Sea. But for most of human history... God isn't doing miracles. Miracles are a very rare thing. We think they happen all the time. So we read through the, the Old Testament scriptures. We see miracle after miracle after miracle. But it's really not that way. There's hundreds of years that pass and generations that pass. where God does nothing. The people of, of, of Israel are in Egypt for generations. Nothing is happening. There's no miracles happening. People are born. They die. They live. They're being persecuted. And people all the time are going, God, where are you? Miracles happen at just the right time for God to prove himself, to show certain things. And this is what he's saying here. The greatest miracle that happened is it happened at just the right time when God broke through history for the first time when he came and didn't just put his hand into history, but came, incarnated himself into history, unique in, in all of history. So God timed the redemption of his people precisely, and after the certain elapsed time, God sent his son not too early, not too late, at just the right time, because we know that God is in control of history. We know also that in Daniel 9, God had a precise time for Jesus to be born. And this is a problem for modern-day Jews, because if they read Daniel 9, Jesus had to come within the confines of the first century. And so looking for Messiah now, they have to kind of reinterpret what Daniel chapter 9 actually says. God knows the precise time of all things down to the very seconds of our lives. It's not, God is not only concerned with the, the millennia and the decades, right? All of down, he's concerned with the very seconds. So Jesus came at a perfect time, at a, at a perfect climactic moment in prophetical history when the period of the Mosaic Law would elapse and a new age would come. That's when Jesus came at just the right time when the Mosaic Law was being moved out of the way so that Jesus could come and fulfill that law while it was still kind of in process, but yet this new age was coming along. So in addition, in addition to God's perfect timing, practically there are reasons why the first century was the best time for Messiah to come. He's kind of hit, hitting those real quick. Because we need to understand that God is taking all things in account. He's taking his calendar in account. He's taking the movement of human history as people develop things into account. And so in the first century, it was, it was prime for the proclamation of the gospel. The Roman Empire brought this thing called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. Uh, there was, despite Rome's uh, empire-building kind of desire, at this time uh, in history, uh, it, there was great political stability throughout the Roman Empire. Before this time, there was a lot of turmoil. There was kind of this... This republic, and there were dictatorships going back and forth, back and forth. After the first century, Rome began to fall apart with, with barbarian incursions and a lot of uh, cultural and uh, morality failures in the culture. But the first century, just the first century, Rome was very, very politically stable. There was freedom of tra trade and travel throughout the known world. 
There were roads being built everywhere. It was unparalleled in ancient history for the world to be unified under this peace where people could travel and have freedom of religion to a certain degree, freedom of, of movement. Um, things, roads were dangerous, but they were safer than they had ever been in history. And so at just the right time of political stability in the world where Rome had the whole known world under one control rather than various cultures controlling things, uh, it was a unique time in history. Also, the Greek language was the language of the empire in, in, in the sense of uh, most people knew that language uh, in addition to their home language, and it was an opportune time for spreading the gospel. Now, the Romans spoke Latin, but the, the language of the people was Greek. So if you wanted to do uh, you know, anything economically or materially, if you were a tradesman, if you would travel, people knew Greek. It was the, it was the, word, the, the language of the empire. And so here we have this, this empire with many different cultures, many different languages, all unified under one language where the gospel could be spread and go culture to culture to culture. So I could go to Scythia, where there were Scythians who spoke Scythian and preach to them in Greek. They would understand the Greek, but they would take that Greek and now they would preach to their own people in the Scythian language, right? And that's what modern missionaries try to do as well. But this was a very, very unique time. There's a third reason, too, but we'll get to that later. So Jesus didn't come at some random time. He came precisely at the moment God had designed from eternity. A time when the gospel would have the greatest ability to spread to all people quickly. By the end of the first century, the gospel had gone throughout the Roman Empire. There were churches at the uttermost parts of the empire. The gospel moved so quickly, and it started with a few guys who really were the dregs of society, who had no idea what they were doing, and deny what Jesus was doing initially until the Holy Spirit came and empowered them. So at just the right time. Then it says he was born of a woman. The phrase born of a woman has this implied reference to the virgin birth, the idea that Jesus eternal, eternally existed as God beforehand, and Mary was simply the conduit where Jesus would be incarnated into the world. He was born of a woman, and the idea he was he existed before then, but he came to earth through this natural process of human birth. And so Jesus took on human flesh by being born of a woman. And this refers to the true, true humanity of Christ and to his deity. This is what Isaiah says about this. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called, this is his titles, right? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So this idea of born of a woman was this promise that God would actually come down, fulfilling all the cries of humanity throughout the centuries. He did that, born of a woman, born under the law. Again, very, very important. Jesus came to keep the law perfectly. Without Jesus keeping the law perfectly, he would not be the Lamb of God without stain, without blemish. And so the third reason why the first century was the best time for Jesus to be born was that the law of Moses was still being practiced and the temple was still there. So Jesus could not only fulfill the moral law, but the ceremonial law as well. Everything could be fulfilled. Without the temple being there, ain't going to happen. The law could not be fulfilled in totality. It was God's timetable that he was born under the law in order to fulfill the law. And after the first century, after 79 AD, when that temple was destroyed, and Judaism began to take on a different flavor, they couldn't go to the temple to sacrifice, uh, the, the, the rabbis, uh, the, the whole synagogue system began to take off, things changed, and it wasn't what it was designed to be by uh, the law of Moses. So Jesus took his place, born as a Jew, under the law, and he perfectly obeyed the law in God's perfect timing so he could redeem everyone who broke the law because he didn't break the law. The first century was the perfect time for that. This is how John puts it. This is in 1 John 3, 5. He puts it very simply. And you know that he, as Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there was no sin. This is why Jesus came. This is why we have Christmas. He was born, manifested, to take away our sins, and in him 
There was no sin. He completed the law. And then in Romans 8, 2, we'll get this later on, let me just read it briefly. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is why Jesus was born, and so that he could fulfill the requirement of the law. And then the last part of that phrase is, so that, he did that, at just the right time, born of a woman, born under the law, so that, why? So that we might receive adoption as children. And so here Paul shifts the metaphor from heirs to adoption as children, um, this idea of a child growing from maturity to, to become an heir to the idea of being adopted into a family. Under Roman law, adopted children had the same legal status and inheritance rights as biological children. So let's, th this is where people got angry. So let's say I have a child, an actual born child, he's 12 years old, right? And now I adopt a child. That child is 14 year old, 14 years old, male. Who gets the inheritance? 14-year-old, not the biological child. They adopt the child because they have the same exact rights, right? And so this is why Paul does not distinguish Jews as biological children and Gentiles as adopted. Both Jew and Gentile are adopted into God's family because no one is born as God's child. We're all born as, as enemies. So Paul suggests that we are all adopted children. None of us have any prior claim to the Father. Our adoption as God's children is a gift of grace. It's not a privilege given to us by being part of the community that the law was given to. So here's the application today. These verses should shift the way we think about Christmas. Unfortunately, in addition to all the modern junk that we have added to Christmas, if you go back in history, in the 4th century, uh, Christians made this subtle shift from celebrating the meaning of Christmas to celebrating the day of Christmas. There's a difference, isn't there? Yeah. Celebrating the day of Christmas as opposed to celebrating the meaning of Christmas. What do I mean by that? What the church did in the 4th century, and it didn't have, the church really didn't celebrate Christmas at all as a, as a day, a holy day, like they did Easter. Um, and so in the 4th century, what happened was the church began to focus for a number of reasons, political and cultural, they began to focus on the baby Jesus. They began to focus on this idyllic scene, right? They began to focus on angels and just what happened on the day, right? Not the meaning, not the theology behind the day. And so in doing so, the church began to forget the meaning of Christmas. So what is the meaning of Christmas according to what we just read here by Paul. What's the meaning of Christmas? Number one, God's sending of his son ended the reign of the law and inaugurates a new age. That's the meaning of Christmas. The law is gone. There is a new age, an age where anyone can be freed from their slavery and adopted as heirs. On, good, on, good Friday, on Christmas Eve, we're going to look at the other passage where Paul talks about at just the right time, Christ died for our sins. It's the same thing, right? That's why the, the phrase is repeated there. Christmas and the cross, they are linked. There is no dis distinction between those things. Yeah. Easter is Christmas. And Christmas is Easter. That's the point. It, it, Christmas is all about the end of the law and the age of grace has come. Furthermore, Christmas is really about that God does all things at the right time and he alone knows the right time. At Christmas, one age ended and another came. One day, one day at just the right time, this age will end too. So number two, Christmas means that we have to have an awareness of God's timing and live our lives accordingly. We live our lives according to God's perfect timing in all things. Uh, this is uh, from 2 Peter 3, 7 through 11. This verse is referring to that day in the future when the age will change again. There's, there's been a dramatic shift in the age of discipline and the law. Now we're in the age of grace, 
And, it's, it, and the, the, the demarcation between those two is the Christmas, the birth of Christ, the age shifted. In the future, there's going to be another event that means the age will change again. And that's the second coming of Christ. But this is what Second Peter says about that change. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. There's that time idea again. God's faithful in time. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is extending this age of grace because he's patient with us, holding off judgment, storing it up, like we talked about in Romans, for the day of judgment. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? How should you prepare for the shifting of ages? You ought to live holy and godly lives. So, yes, Christmas is about a baby born in a manger, but if we forget that God has inaugurated a new age where slaves can be made free, we have missed Christmas and simply celebrated a story. If we don't understand that we are in a new age, then all we've done is celebrated a special day. We celebrated a season. And we've missed the point of Christmas. If we know God but just celebrate the season, then these closing words of Paul apply to us. Notice what he says, verse 9 of Galatians 4. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are running back to those weak and miserable forces, those ideas? Do you wish to be enslaved by, by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. Very, very strong words. When we get caught up on the Christmas season and forget that Christmas is the opportune time for explaining to people that there is grace, that a new age has come. They don't need to be enslaved anymore. The best Christmas word that we can use is the word slavery. Let's move ourselves out from slavery and, and stop giving in to these elemental spirits. Now these things are okay, right? They're, but they're the additions to. They're not the main thing. If you go through Christmas and you are simply celebrating the season, and, we, and we'll say, things, but I'm celebrating the reason for the season. Really? Are you? Oh, are you just celebrating this? If you are, and all that effort is in the season and not in the real meaning that a new age has come, the law has moved away, and now we're in the age of grace, then you are doing exactly what Paul is saying. You are enslaving yourself to worshiping something else rather than what we should be focused on. And that's why in the 4th century, the church went down the tube. It became a, a political entity. And, because, and they celebrated holidays really, really well. Right? And they, they celebrated religion really, really well. And they had lots of rules for people to follow really, really well that enslaved them all over again. But you and I, we're free in Christ. We're free to proclaim a new age has come, free to live lives that are holy and godly, as now we wait for God to do everything in his perfect time once again. Let's pray. Father, we stand before you, we, and first of all, God, we ask for forgiveness when we focus on, 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 on the things that are extraneous, and we, we, we celebrate the day and the season rather than the meaning, rather than the meat behind what you've been trying to tell us. Jesus didn't come to be put on a mantle so we can look at a pretty idyllic scene. Jesus came to, to die, to inaugurate this new age where there is grace and there is hope and there is mercy and there is forgiveness. And, and then, God, you established a church to, to carry out that mission, proclaiming that Christmas is about freedom from slavery.
and not being bound again to these elemental spirit, these basic principles that we get so hooked up on that is simply human intuition and, and human stories and uh, philosophies that cannot save, and in fact, enslave us again. Mm -hmm. Father, open our eyes to your word. Uh, help us take words like this that are very difficult, especially in a culture like ours, to take to heart. Father, we love you, uh, but, but we confess that we get caught up in these things. But we thank you that you meet us right where we're at as we struggle in the in-betweens between uh, our culture and, and our upbringing and our experiences and the truth of your word that lay, lays those things out for all to see. Father, may we live lives that are holy and godly and pleasing to you until that day comes where you appear and once again, Everything changes at just the right time. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.